the gym instructor pointed to my father online and said, Cyril Tyson, everyone look at him. He does not have the body type that would excel in track. And they used him as an example. And he says, what? No one is gonna tell me what I can't do in my life. And he used that as a reason to start running. And he started track in that moment. He decided that his, one of his next tasks in life would be to take up running and excel at it. Within a few years of that, he became world class. At one time, had the fifth fastest time in the world. In 1948, the Olympics was not yet ready to come back to us because we're still reeling, roiling from the Second World War. Instead, it was still an Olympics. It was called the GI Olympics, and it was held in Hitler Stadium. Whoa. So he competed alongside Jewish athletes. So there they are competing against the New York Athletic Club, and his best friend, Johnny Johnson, was coming around the back stretch, might have been the quarter mile, coming on the final straightaway. And a runner from the New York Athletic Club is a few paces behind him. And Johnny Johnson overhears that runner's coach say, catch that bigger. And he overheard this. And so what did he say to himself? He said, this is one he ain't gonna catch. <laughs> and that extended his, his, his lead to the finish line. At the end of the day, what matters is for who and what you become in life, for me at least, was uh, what level of wisdom did he glean in his life and then successfully communicate to me, either by example or by just explicit statement. And that combination of those two means of delivery had some important uh, impacts. We live in a very fractured world today. I don't know if it's the most fractured ever, but what is clear is that the internet has enabled, and social media have enabled people to tribalize. You might go your whole life without ever finding another person who thinks the earth is flat. You go online and you see them all. So you have ways to say why you are different from other people. And I don't know that that's always a healthy place to be. You can draw a line in the sand between people who transgress but do not hold power over you from those who transgress and do. So the coach who said, catch that nigga, he doesn't have power over Johnny Johnson unless you allow him to. This is a famous quote from Martin Luther King. You can only be ridden if your back is bent. I, I apportioned my emotional reactions to where it actually mattered for my life's trajectory. When I grew up, it was very common to hear the phrase, Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. This was an inoculation against hate speech, really, against just evil people, just nasty people. You were able to develop a, set, a system of defenses against unpleasant people out there. I haven't heard that phrase in a long time. I don't hear it recited in the elementary schools. What I think has happened over the years is we came to learn as a civilization that words can be hurtful and words can sort of um, change your mood or set you into a depression. What I see on the flip side of that coin, however, is people are less able to deal with the very same people who are around today who were around back then, who are calling you names, the people who might be um, bullying you on the internet by, by saying things about you. We, I don't know that we have how to defend against that now other than seeing a counselor for your emotional state. I can say from the era in which I grew up, I don't give a rat's ass what you say to me, okay? Um, unless you are between me and some goal, then I ha I'll have to navigate that some way. So now what do I need to do because you're in my way? Do I dig under you, go around you, leap over you? You gotta navigate it. I think high school, that's where you learn how to deal with difficult people. There's not a single high school movie that doesn't show the angst of the cliques that have formed and what the relationships are that they have to one another. It's this microcosm of real stuff that goes on in the real world. 
There are beautiful people and they will get jobs you're not gonna get, okay? There are people who are nasty. You're gonna have to navigate them. There are people who you cannot interact with for whatever reason or another. They're gonna be in the cubicle next to you in your workplace. So I think we undervalue the total social pot that people are tossed into in their high school experience. For me, what I do for the public is prime, almost 80 plus percent of it is driven by duty, not by ambition. Because I can do something, and if I can do it better than others, and it's for a greater good in society, I would be irresponsible if I did not. That many people look for meaning in life. And I'm thinking to myself, you have more power than that. You have the power to create meaning in your life rather than passively look for it. So for me, I create the meaning. And meaning to me is, do I know more about the world today than I did yesterday? That enhances meaning for me. And if that accumulates and, and accrues daily, in a month, you, you know way more than you did than just that day later, so that you continue to grow. No one ever told me that I had to search for meaning in life to begin with. So that was never even a part of me. My first question of me wasn't, where do I find meaning? It was, how do I create meaning? And that started early, early teens. School, they view you as this empty vessel that they pour information in, and you test it over here, you get a high grade, you're praised. You might even give the commencement speech. Is that who become the shakers and movers of the world? I, I can tell you this, if, if, we're, if Einstein were here and we're talking with Einstein, we, we could talk to him for hours and hours and hours. You know what question will never come out of our mouths? Is, what college did you go to? <laughs> I wanna go to that same college. I bet most of your people who've sat in this chair, it's not about what college they went to. It's about their own initiative, their own drive, their own ambitions, their own curiosity. That is not taught in school. Sadly, school should, as a minimum, preserve that curiosity for you. It, yeah, if you lost some of it, because it's not gonna be in all of us, put it back in. So that when you graduate school, you can give literal meaning to the word commencement. Commencement means beginning. It doesn't mean ending. And so you leave school and you say to yourself, I now know how to learn. I now have a curiosity of all things I have yet to be exposed to, and I will now become a lifelong learner. Uh, I'm a scientist, um, raised Catholic, but started drifting when I was like in third grade. None of it was making much sense to me. There were no decisions made in the house that referenced the Bible or God or Jesus or anything. So in that sense, decision-making was secular and rationally informed. And I thank my parents for that. I valued that as someone being raised by them because it meant if something didn't make sense, they will do it because I said so. Well, that's not a rational reply to your child. They would have the reason for it and then we'd discuss the reasons. Early on, as I became more visible, I'd get letters and people would ask about God. And I don't know much about God. You know, so I, my early letters were, well, science is, the, religion is that, and it, I can't help you any further. But then I thought to myself, that's not fair to the person who wrote the question. They're coming from a place, some religious tradition, whatever that tradition is, and I, if, if I'm receiving that letter, there's a contract, an implicit contract between me and the person who's seeking my guidance, my wisdom my insights and I owe it to that person to know as much as possible as I can about where they're coming from. I read things that take me to places where other people think. If I'm an educator, I wanna know that because when you're speaking to me and I have some understanding of you, I, I can navigate your receptors for learning. In this book, one of 
what took me a year to answer one of the questions. It was a, a Jewish woman. Okay, she's orthodox, she's really religious, she's got a 10-year-old son, going to Hebrew school, he's on the autism spectrum, and he says, by the way, one day he came home and said he doesn't believe in God. And he thinks Bible stories can't possibly be true. And she asks him, how did you come to think this? And he said, cosmos. <laughs> I was like, okay, so I'm in deep now. Okay. <laughs> Should I read further? Where is this going to go? This can only end badly, I'm saying to myself. And it turned out she was very open. She said, you know, I don't want to make him believe things that might not be true. He respects wow. you. I know that, and I thank you for that. But sometimes I have my doubts, too, about these stories in the Bible. So I just don't know, you know, can science and God coexist? And... I just want to be a good parent. I want, to, I, I want to teach you how to think about the world. And then you say, I have a new way to understand the world. And you just run off. Don't, you don't even look back because a new level of hunger has descended upon you. And methods and tools to feed that hunger are now accessible to you. So my impact would be that others are impacted and they don't even remember that I had something to do with it. On my tombstone, I want the epitaph, be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. You want the world to be, any of us, I think, should want the world to be a little better off for you having lived in it. That doesn't mean people praising you, that that's, no, not even about that. So what do you have to give with no expectation of return?